Welcome back to the deep dive. We've looked through this massive stack of research you sent over on global fossil fuel use, and, well, the findings are pretty shocking, honestly. They really are. You know, despite all the talk, all the climate conferences and pledges, the data seems to show we're not just failing to cut back on fossil fuels. We're actually going backwards. In some key areas, yes. Actively increasing our reliance. Okay, so that's our mission for this deep dive then. Let's dig into the actual numbers. What's really happening with fossil fuel use, especially since the global population hit 8 billion, and what are the consequences we're already seeing? Right, and just to set the stage, the core problem the sources point to is simple. Coal, oil, gas, the primary energy sources, but they're finite. You burn them once. And burning them releases greenhouse gases, CO2 mainly. Exactly, which heats the air, but critically, most of that heat, it gets absorbed by the oceans, the deep oceans. And that ocean warming. It cap. That's the link, isn't it, between burning <laughs> fuel today and these huge problems down the line, like sea level rise. Precisely. That's the mechanism we need to unpack. All right, let's start where the emissions are biggest. Electricity generation. The research is crystal clear on this. Coal-fired power stations are the number one source of greenhouse gases globally. Yeah, and what really jumped out at me from the sources was the acceleration. I mean, in 2023, there were about 8,509 coal plants globally. That's roughly 33% of all power. Okay. But the projection for late 2025, it's estimated to be uh, 9,010 plants. Wait, more. We're building more than we're closing. That's what it looks like. More capacity coming online. And I suppose the simple reason is... There's just so much coal left. Well, the supply is definitely a factor. The data suggests we've got something like 134 years of coal reserves globally. It's immense. Wow. And where are these plants concentrated? Very heavily concentrated. About half of all operating coal plants, that's 3,037, are in China. Right. Now, here's something that seemed like a huge contradiction in the research. China's president pledged back in 2020 carbon-free by 2040, wasn't it? That was the pledge, yes. Yet the sources say China's currently building over half the world's new coal plants, like 165 new ones planned or under construction by late 2025. How does that, how does that square? Well, the sources strongly suggest it's about short-term needs overriding long-term goals. China's economy, its industry, it's expanding so fast. They need power now. Yeah. Reliable power. Exactly. Reliable, cheap, baseline power. And coal provides that. Even while they're also investing massively in renewables, it seems the immediate demand is just, it's winning out over those climate pledges for now. Okay. Beyond coal, what about natural gas? That's still a fossil fuel. Absolutely. Accounts for about 24% of power stations. And we need to remember, gas is mostly methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas itself. And who are the big users there? The data points to Russia having the most gas plants, around 177, then China again with 163, and Germany actually has quite a few too, about 131. Okay, let's talk pollution totals. The absolute numbers can be kind of misleading, can't they? They can. So in just sheer tons of CO2 per year, China leads about 10,065 million tons. The USA is second at 5,416 million tons. So nearly double the U.S. total. Hang on, population difference is huge, isn't it? China's got, what, 1.4 billion people? 1.412 billion, yeah. Compared to the U.S. at 331 million. So if you adjust for that per person, who's emitting more? Right, and that's where the picture flips completely. When you look at it per capita, yeah. per person, the USA comes out as the biggest emitter, <sighs> followed by China. So it really depends on how you frame the question. You know, Is it about the total load on the atmosphere or individual consumption patterns? Both seem pretty important metrics, frankly. Definitely. And it's not just the power grid we need to look at. Right. Transportation. That's another huge slice of the pie. What did the sources say? About 24% of global CO2 emissions. That's the figure. 24%. Overwhelmingly from burning petrol, diesel, you know, in cars, trucks, vans. It's mostly road vehicles. Yeah. The concentration there is amazing. 72% of all global transport emissions just from road vehicles. 72%. Wow. And that specific sector road transport saw an 80% increase in its emissions between 1970 and 2020. Just enormous growth. And in the U.S. specifically. Is transport a big deal there too? It's huge. For the U.S., the transport sector is the single biggest source of their greenhouse gas emissions. Accounts for about 29% of the U.S. total. 29%. Okay, so what about the solution we always hear about? Electric vehicles. Well, yeah, we hear about EVs constantly. But the 2022 data in the sources it paints a, let's say, a more gradual picture. How gradual? Globally, back in 2020, only about 4% of all transport vehicles were electric. 4%. Only 4 That seems tiny compared to the hype. 
especially when you think about places like Norway, right? Aren't they mostly EV now? Well, Norway's an interesting case. Population small, about 5.8 million, and yes, 58% of their new car sales were EVs. Pretty impressive. 58% new sales, but compare that to the U.S. population, 331 million. And in the U.S., only 4% of new car sales were electric in 2022. Okay, that contrast really highlights the challenge, doesn't it? The sheer scale in bigger economies makes that transition incredibly slow. It does. And that phrase the sources used, a slow burner. Yeah. It seems to apply to renewables like solar, too. Really? Even solar? Yeah, take Australia. Has the highest solar radiation anywhere on the planet, apparently, but only generates 1% or 2% of its power from solar. Why so low? Part of it is the cost of importing panels, which mostly come from China, and part of it is just the difficulty of integrating that intermittent power into the existing grid. It's complex. So globally, home solar uptake is also kind of slow. The source has described it as that slow burner, yeah. Around 3.9% across the EU, USA, Pacific, Australia combined. So it confirms the trend. Renewables are growing, sure, but nowhere near fast enough to cancel out that increase in coal we talked about earlier. That seems to be the uncomfortable reality right now. Okay, so let's shift to the consequences. All this extra heat absorbed by the oceans. What does it actually do? Right, so it drives sea level rise. Two main physical reasons, according to the research. One, warmer water makes glaciers melt faster. Simple enough. And the second. The seawater itself actually expands as it gets warmer. Thermal expansion. Ah, Okay. And this isn't theoretical, is it? The source has mentioned that water world scenario. Yeah, that Kevin Costner movie opening. Right. But it said that for some Pacific Island nations, rising seas, bigger king tides, that's already their reality. It's happening now. Exactly. It's not some distant future for everyone. Yeah. And the Pacific is seeing it first partly because the ocean temperatures there are already higher to begin with. It speeds up both effects. And looking north, Greenland, the numbers there were just... Unbelievable. Staggering, aren't they? NASA satellites show Greenland has lost 6 trillion tons of ice mass just since the year 2000. 6 trillion tons. It's hard to even get your head around that amount. It really is. But maybe even more important is the committed damage. The research confirms that based on warming that's already happened, Greenland alone is going to contribute about 10 inches to sea level rise. No matter what we do now, that's locked in. 10 inches just from Greenland. Guaranteed. Wow. And if all of Greenland's ice eventually melted? Sea levels would rise by 7.4 meters, over 24 feet. Okay. And this ties into what the source is called Arctic amplification. The Arctic warming faster than elsewhere. Precisely. We've seen about a 50% reduction in the area of Arctic sea ice since monitoring started. Mm -hmm. And the ice that's left, it's about 45% thinner than it was 30 years ago. Good grief. And the prediction is ice-free Arctic summer soon. By 2035, as the prediction mentioned, ice-free during the summer melt season. Which sounds bad enough. But this is where it gets really, really worrying. This faster warming speeds up the thawing of permafrost across the Arctic, yeah. you know, permanently frozen ground. Right, and what happens when that thaws? It releases methane gas. Methane trapped underground from ancient plants that decomposed ages ago. This is the methane ticking bomb the sources refer to. And methane? Yep. That's much worse than CO2, isn't it? Oh, dramatically worse. The sources state it's 63 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2 over the shorter term. 63 times. Whoa. So you get this dangerous positive feedback loop. More warming thaws, more permafrost, which releases more methane. Which causes more warming. Which melts more ice and thaws more permafrost releasing even more methane. It's a cycle that accelerates itself, and we've already pushed the start button with past emissions. And it's not just the Arctic. The sources also highlight the Himalayan glaciers, the so-called third pole. Right, what's happening there? Those glaciers are thinning rapidly, too, which threatens the water supply for nearly a billion people downstream in Asia. A billion people. And it also impacts hundreds of hydroelectric power plants, about 251 mentioned, in places like Nepal and Pakistan that rely on that steady meltwater flow. Okay, so critical impacts in Asia, too. Now let's go south, Antarctica. The scale down there is just immense. It is. Holds about 60% of all the fresh water on the entire planet locked up in ice. And are we seeing major changes there too? Yeah, definitely. The sources focus on specific areas like the Pine Island Glacier. It's huge, about four times the size of England. Four times England. Okay. And that one glacier, it's already accounted for about 4% of all the sea level rise we've seen globally in the last 30 years. 4% from one glacier. Yeah. 
And if it were to collapse entirely, it alone could add another 28 centimeters, almost a foot, to global sea levels. Just staggering potential. So, putting it all together, what's the overall forecast for sea level rise this century? Based on current trends, the sources indicate we should expect a minimum, a minimum of one meter, about 3.3 feet, of global sea level rise by the year 2100. A minimum of one meter, okay. And this leads us to what the sources call the ultimate paradox, the sort of final terrible irony in all this. What's that? The consequences of burning fossil fuels, the melting ice, are now directly enabling more fossil fuel extraction. Wait, how? You mean because the ice is gone, they can get to reserves easier? Exactly that. As the Arctic ice melts, huge oil and gas reserves under the seabed, estimated at maybe 25% of the world's undiscovered reserves, become physically accessible uh -huh. and financially viable to drill for, yep. which they weren't before because of the thick ice cover. And countries are actually planning to do this. Oh, yes. The sources mention both Russia and the USA have massive projects planned or underway to access these newly reachable Arctic fossil fuels. So we burn fuel, which melts ice, which opens up more fuel to burn, which will melt more ice. It's a vicious cycle. It's the ultimate exploitation loop, as the source material puts it. The problem is literally feeding its own acceleration. So if we try to synthesize all this from our deep dive, the key takeaways from the research are pretty stark. Yeah. One, we're not slowing down global consumption overall. In key areas like coal power, it's actually increasing. Right. Driven a lot by China's massive coal infrastructure. Yes, in absolute terms. But two, when you look per capita, the USA leads in emissions per person. So responsibility is complex. Right. And three, perhaps the most immediate danger highlighted is that Arctic amplification feedback loop. The permafrost thaw releasing methane that gas being 63 times more potent than CO2 is, well, it's a critical accelerator. Yeah, and the really tough pill to swallow reading this was the point about locked-in warming. Even if we magically stopped all fossil fuel burning today, the melt continues for something like another 150 years, the sources suggest, because the heat's already stored in the system, especially the oceans. Exactly, the damage is already done to a large extent, but the crucial challenge is we're not stopping we're still actively increasing our usage while this clock is ticking. Which brings us to a final thought. We know Greenland alone has locked in about 10 inches of sea level rise. We know the minimum forecast globally is one meter by 2100. Minimum one meter, mm -hmm. three feet plus. So thinking purely based on that science, that minimum commitment, what specific infrastructure, maybe which major coastal city defenses around the world need to be completely reevaluated and redesigned right now? Not for some distant maybe, but for that guaranteed minimum rise. That's the urgent question, isn't it? What plans are based on outdated assumptions? A sobering thought to end on.